Good morning, Father's House. It's a joy to be here with you, and thank you very much for the invitation to come into your home. And uh, it is our prayer, our earnest prayer, that the moments we have to be with you this morning will also be encouraging, uplifting, and as the Holy Spirit moves through your home, Lord God, I just pray, pray with me, I just pray, Father God, that as your Spirit moves through their, your home and, and each and every one of these homes touches everyone who is out there, I ask you, Lord, wherever they may be, whatever they're doing, whatever situation they're facing, your grace, your peace, and your marvelous love, just fill that house and fill their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to continue in our series uh, this morning for such a time as this. And let's face it, this is a unique time. I mean, when you think about it, we're, we're fighting just about everything. We're, we're, we're fighting uh, the possibilities of economic collapse, uh, uh, we're fighting, fighting a, a, a global pandemic, and, uh, I, well, we're fighting each other on just about every possible level. We need to stop and rethink who we are and what we're doing and who called us to do it. In the book of Esther, there's a marvelous story, and this is, Esther is where we're being drawn from. And uh, the, the, in that story, last week, Pastor Anita and Pastor Terry shared, shared with you most of the uh, uh, story about Esther and how she came about, but I'm just going to recap it a little bit. Esther was a beautiful young woman. She uh, was one of those people that we've all experienced, uh, people like that you meet, and maybe you only spend 15, 20 minutes, maybe half a day with them, and when you leave, it's like you've, you've just left your best friend. Uh, they've got that unique personality that just brings you in and welcomes you. And she had that kind of personality because that's a gift from God. She was beautiful on the outside, beautiful on the inside. And she was able to uh, participate in a, in a contest, a beauty contest, a Miss Persia beauty contest, actually, and she won. And as a result, she was then crowned queen by King Xerxes. Now, there's three characters in the book of Esther that are prominent. They stand out. Now, if you read the book, you'll find there's a whole lot of people named here, but there's three that stand out that really tell us the story. There's Esther, of course. There's Mordecai, her cousin, and there's Haman. Esther, Mordecai, and Haman. That's what I want to talk about today, those three, because even though God himself is not named in this book, you will find his character interwoven to every aspect of it, the appointments, the, the, the personalities that he has developed. Let's, let's talk about that for a quick moment. Esther was a young woman, as I said, a beautiful young lady, not only beautiful in heart and body, but beautiful in her spirit. She loved God. Haman was her cousin. He was a devout Jew. He loved her. He raised her. She, he was older than she was, and when her parents died, Mordecai took Esther into his house and cared for her as a father and loved her and then, of course, there's, there's Haman. Haman is, uh, well, he's a sociopath who has been appointed to a very high position within the government. Uh, I guess the best way you could define him is he would be like the Secretary of State. And when he received that appointment by the king, the king also put out an edict that said that everyone was to bow, was to, to, to kneel down before Haman as he passed by. Now, What's interesting about that is that everybody seemed to do that, except for one guy, Mordecai. Mordecai, who, who loved God, wasn't going to bow down to anybody but God. That kind of got Haman's upset. Imagine, if you would, picture this. He's going down the road. He's probably riding either in a cart or on a, in a chariot or maybe on a horse or maybe just walking along. He's got his entire entourage with him. And as he's going down, everybody on both sides simply stop whatever they're doing, bow down, and humbly give their adoration to him. But there's one guy still standing. Right in the middle of that crowd, he stands out pretty good because he's not about to bend. He's just kind of watching what's going by. Haman decided he was going to take care of business and he was going to kill Mordecai, but he wasn't going to leave it at that. He decided he would not only kill Mordecai, but he'll kill all of Mordecai's people, all the Jews. Once again, we read this in history over and over and over, even in our more recent history. There's this 
considered effort to get rid of God's people. Doesn't work. Never does. Now Mordecai, being a person that loved Esther, it says in the scripture he would walk back and forth in front of the gate, constantly asking, seeking, wanting to know more what was going on in Esther's life. And when Mordecai got word of the fact that Haman was going to kill himself and then everyone else, he went out and instead of doing what, well, we would tend to do, he didn't go out on some street corner and start shouting the protests and getting people to gather together and get them all excited and then start yelling and screaming and yipping and hollering about how this is a cruel and unusual punishment toward a people. No, what he did is he went to the authority above the king. He went to God. He said he fasted and he prayed and he wept before God and asked for intercession. Now, it doesn't say this in the Scripture, but I would venture to say that God then spoke to Mordecai and said, you know what? You've got somebody on the inside. Why don't you go talk to her? Mordecai then sends a note, sends a message to Esther. Let me read that message to you. It's in the fourth chapter, beginning in the 11th verse. It says this. All the king's officials... And the people of the... Oh, correction, I'm sorry. Uh, when Mordecai sent the message, this is the return message from Esther to Mordecai. Mordecai asked her, go before the king. So she sends this message back. All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Now, let me, let me paraphrase that a little bit. Esther gets this message from Mordecai to go in and talk to the king. She sends a message back and says, listen, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, that ain't a healthy move. Okay, because... Here's the situation. The problem, the problem is, is the king has already has a law in place. And by the way, notice how she says all these people know it. She's basically saying, uh, Cousin Mordecai, you know this, so why are you asking me to do this? Well, he asked anyway. But then look at the last sentence. The last sentence, oh, and, and, and you get this. Can you imagine also, she no doubt probably feels pretty concerned about this. Not only is there a law against it, but if you read the first portion of the scriptures, you will find that, uh, well, Xerxes had another wife just in front of this wife. And that didn't work out too good because she didn't obey the law either. So, I mean, it's kind of a role here. And then she says, but 30 days have passed since I was called to the king. Now, we have a tendency to always reflect on what we see in the movies. Every time the king came out and sat on the throne, right next to him was the queen. Everywhere the king went, somewhere right around him was the queen, who also had a great deal of authority. That wasn't the case here. That wasn't the case here because the queen, even the queen, never entered the king's presence unless he summoned them. Now, gentlemen, if you're sitting in your house, you best not make any comment about that. Things could go really bad for you. All right? She's saying, he hasn't summoned me in almost, in, in, in a month, 30 days. Now, for me to be able to, let me, let me put it another way so you can kind of get the idea here. Imagine, imagine that you live next door to someone that is very attractive to you, okay? Now, when I say next door, I'm not talking about in a different house or down the block. I'm talking about like a duplex. They're on, the same, this, they're on this side of the building and you're on this side of the building. Well, finally, you get an opportunity to go out on that first date. And you go out on that first date, and, and uh, it works out pretty well. Actually, everybody is uh, quite pleased about it. The two of you hit it off perfectly. You go home, and just as you depart, you look at each other, and both of you say almost at the same time, I'll call you. You don't get a call for a month. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody tells me they're going to call me and I don't hear from them in a week, I figured it didn't work out. She had a pretty good idea that maybe she wasn't all that she hope, had hoped to be. Maybe the 
king really didn't see in her all that she thought he did, even though he, he may have given her a crown. For 30 days after that first date, it's done. So now what does she do? Well, Mordecai sends back another note. Do not think, this is verse 12 and 14, do not think that because you are in the king's house, that you alone, of all the Jews, will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Think about that. But you and your father's family will perish. And you, who knows but that you have come to a royal position for just such a time as this. Now, you may not be in a royal position, but you are still in position that God has called you to be in for such a time as this. What he is saying to her is simply, simply this, that whatever danger you may face, it's not going to be any greater whether you do something or do nothing. You must be willing to take the risk. That, that makes me think of a, another incident in our history, just recent history, actually, some 19 years ago when United Airlines Flight 93 crashed into the fields of Somerset County in Pennsylvania. What happened aboard that plane was all the passengers knew that a risk had to be taken because it had been taken over by terrorists. And what they did is they collectively gathered together and they stepped up and stepped out. The plane crashed. Everyone died. Now you may say, well, see, if they hadn't have done that, no, that plane was destined to crash and everyone was, was destined to die. The difference was is that they made a difference. They actually stopped more lives from being taken than their own. Could they have possibly taken it? Possibly. It was worth the risk. But they stopped it. They stopped what could have been an absolute greater tragedy than already had taken place in our country. It's an incredible story. But risk is part of our life. And we can't get around that. She then sends back another note. Verse 16. Then Esther sent this reply. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Wow. That is great courage in the midst of great risk. But she's willing to do it. She's willing to step out. Why would anyone ever want to take that kind of risk? Because you have to come to the place of recognizing you were created to take a risk. You were appointed to take a risk. We have within our nature a risk desire. We want to risk something some way. Now, it comes in various levels. And some people, you say, oh, no, that person never took a risk. I, I heard of a, a fellow, in fact, I, I actually met one gentleman who never took a risk. He never did anything. He never took a risk in his finances or his family or anything. And when he died, he had a life insurance policy, but the company wouldn't pay up because they said if he hadn't lived, he probably didn't die. Well, no. We've been born to take a risk. Yeah, I mean, think about this. I looked this up. Do you know over 4,000 people this year will, for the first time, take up rock climbing? Now, I'm not talking about that kind of rock climbing where you go into an air-conditioned gymnasium and they got an artificial wall with all these colored little places where you step and you've got a brace around you with a cable in case you fall and a lot of cushions on the floor. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the kind of rock climbing where you jam your fingers and your toes into the crevices and cracks of a sheer face wall and you defy not only gravity but good common sense. That happens. Over 4,000 will do that for the first time this year. Over 5,000 people will jump out of a perfectly good airplane and expect their bed sheet to keep them from hitting the ground too fast. Risk? Yeah, there's a lot of risk. There's quite a bit of risk. In fact, <laughs> in fact, there's also a large group of people that are going to demonstrate the brilliant human ingenuity of tying a rubber band around their ankles and flinging their carcasses off a bridge. You have to ask yourself, really, 
in all honesty. What is wrong with us? We are risk takers. We just take foolish risks. God wants us to take a risk. He created us that way. He wants us to be willing to give things up in order to get something greater or at least reach a greater goal. Now, I don't wish to offend. I really don't. But we seem to have a deep desire for success without cost. We have this, this inner working that battles that risk element for victory without jeopardy or any kind of gain without sacrifice. And I believe that's where we've come. I believe, and I'm speaking for myself only, but I believe the church has become that kind of group. We've become a club. Now, please understand, I'm not talking about the Father's House. I'm not talking about First Baptist. I'm not talking about any church facility or group. I'm talking about the church, the body of Christ. We have settled. We've gotten comfortable. And when things aren't comfortable, we kind of wonder what happened. In our club, we have our established rules and we have our regular meetings and there's a little clubhouse on just about every corner. Is there anything wrong with that? No, there's not. There's not. We need those oases. We need those people. There's nothing wrong with that. But when we come to a place to where the world needs to be changed and we allow someone else to do it and don't take the responsibility ourselves, then why do we as as a collective group, go home and sit around with other people of like faith and complain about the fact that God isn't in our schools anymore. God isn't in our world anymore. I want you to know, a sinning, unbelieving world did not kick God out. We refused to keep Him in. We didn't want to take the risk. We didn't want to be disliked. We didn't want to offend. We didn't want to... Guys, plan on it. Jesus offended people to the point they crucified Him. And He wants you to follow. He took the ultimate risk and paid the ultimate price. He simply asked us to step out like Mordecai and say, you know what? I'm not bending my knee. I'm going to stand. And Mordecai, you may not be an Esther, but you are always going to be a Mordecai. You are there to encourage, uplift, and support others that they might be able to take that risk and make a difference. Esther had a voice, and she spoke. We have a voice, and we must speak. Let me give you a few things about the risk that God provides for us. There's a few, few simple little things. First off, that kind of risk, that kind of risk comes with a promise. In, in the book of Matthew, and I'm going to paraphrase these scriptures. Uh, look them up. Matthew chapter 13, verse, beginning with verse 44. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to paraphrase it. Jesus is speaking to the people, and he's, he's saying the kingdom of heaven is like a, a treasure that's found in a piece of land. And the man who found that treasure gets so excited about it. He's so overwhelmed with what he found. He goes out and he sells and gets rid of everything, everything that he has, and goes back and buys that land because that's where the true treasure lies. He goes on to say, Jesus says, there's also a, a man who was a pearl merchant and, and he found this marvelous pearl of great value. And it says he went out and he sold everything he had. He got rid of everything and came back and bought that one pearl. What he's saying there to us is simply the fact that we need to see his love and his compassion and his life that can be lived through us. We need to see that in such a way that we're willing to give up everything we have to hold it, to attain to it, to experience it, and to share it. We need to risk it all because of the love that we have for Him, because of the value He has in our life. You know, the promises, the promises that God gives us are not some part of some divine employment package that is handed out to every single Christian when they bow their knee before God. And we've kind of made it that way. Turn around and look at some of the, some of the preaching that takes place on television, if you, if you doubt this. And I would say two-thirds of it, if not more, is going to tell you that when you give your heart to Christ, everything's going to come up roses. 
that you're supposed to get more wealthy, you're supposed to always get more healthy, you're supposed to get more. No. Read your Bible. Read the lives of those who are the very foundation of who we are as a church. And you'll see that their lives were not lifted up instantly and suddenly they were the great ones. Suddenly they were the prosperous ones. Suddenly they had the mansion on the hill. No, they became the light on the hill, but they didn't own the house out there. You know, it's nothing wrong with having stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong was when the stuff has you. That's where we start to turn away. Christianity was not built on lives that were lived out in mediocrity. There were lives that were willing to step up and refuse to bow to anyone but God. That was the difference. And we are becoming comfortable in our cushioned seats and air-conditioned sanctuaries. And there's nothing wrong with that, except for it, 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 that can't be the end of it. That has to be the start of it. We walk outside a church or outside your home, you've entered the mission field that God has called you to with an appointed time and all the appointed gifts. Don't assume that, well, I'm not, I'm not that beautiful person like Esther was. Or I'm not that, that rich person like, like maybe Mordecai had been. I don't know. You are the one God called. He wants no more or less from you than what He has placed within you. Don't ask to be something else or someone else. Don't look out to somebody else and say, gee, I wish I was like Pastor Tim. He has such excitement and so much love for people. Gosh, I wish I was a little bit like him. You know what? God made him. He didn't make me to be him. And when I show up to the heavens, I would tell you God will look down one day and he'll say, you know what? I, um, I really wish you'd have been more like you. I love Tim, but I didn't need two of them. Trust him, I know Tim. All right? This is a, uh, uh, then there's a, the, the parable in, in uh, Luke 19. This is, this is risk with a view. In Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 12, Jesus tells this unique parable. He says that a king had gone away, or actually a man had gone away to become a king, and before he left, he gave 10 of his servants money. And he says, here, do something with this, and I'll be back and pick it up later. He comes back, and nine of them actually did whatever they could with it. And it doesn't say, it only talks about the first two. Possibly the rest of them lost the money. It doesn't say. But there was one guy in the group, and that's where the story is focused on, that simply gave the money back to the, the uh, landlord, to the manager, to the master, whoever he was, gave it back to him and said, I knew you were a hard man, so here's your money back. A life of mediocrity, a life that is focused only on your own personal comforts and the refusal to take a risk will warp your perspective of God. And here's what I mean by that. This man was looking at the one who gave him the money to begin with. The man who said, give it a shot. And what does he say to the man? He doesn't just say, here's your money back, I took care of it for you. He looks at him and says, because I know you're a hard man. If he was a hard man, he wouldn't have given him anything and said, you better have something when I get back. No, he was willing to give it up. Our perspective of God can be distorted as well when our comforts are more important than our calling. We have to step up and move out. We have to. We have no choice. Then there's the parable. Well, actually, forgive me, this is not a parable. This is anything but a parable. It's a risk with a result. In John chapter 6, verse, beginning with verse 5, there's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Everybody knows that story. The feeding of the 5,000. And if you read that in the book of Luke, you'll see that Jesus turns to Philip. And he tells Philip, he says, where can we go and buy food for these people? Because he saw that they were hungry. And Philip, first thing out of his mouth is this, What? It's going to take us eight months. Eight months of pay would only give everybody one bite. I had somebody figure that out one time. It works out to around $300,000. I don't know where he got that figure, but that's a lot of money. Isn't it interesting? Jesus looks at people with need, and he's moved to make some way of fulfilling that need, and his disciples saw them as an expense. They didn't see them as hungry people. 
But let me throw this back. Let's look at the group for a second. Have you ever really thought about this? There are 5,000 people, 5,000 men, 5,000 men. It's assumed that many of them brought their wives. Let's say half brought their wives. So now you've got 7,500 people. And those wives, of course, probably brought their children. They didn't have sitters at the time, I would assume. So they may have brought them. They weren't off to school somewhere. And besides, they needed to be at mama's side. So let's just say that half of the parents brought two of their kids. So now you've got a total of 10,000 people. There's 10,000 lives out there. The disciples go out and start looking for food. They can't find any. Now, granted, men will not take direction or even seek it out. They're going to get their, the pioneering spirit requires them to go and get lost wherever they may be. But one thing you can be assured a man probably won't do when he walks out into the wilderness, knowing that there isn't going to be a 7-Eleven where they could get a Slurpee, they're going to take something with them to drink. I wouldn't necessarily say they'll take something to eat, but they'll probably take something to drink. Now the women. The women with their children, there isn't a world possibility that they're going to walk outside that house taking those kids and not bring something for them to eat. 10,000 people and nobody had anything? Really? I, I picture this. Picture this. I can just imagine that as the disciples are going through and asking if there's food, that some sweet little sister looked up and smiled and reached down into her knapsack to pull out a piece of bread. But just as she did, her husband reached over and went, uh, uh, hold it, <laughs> don't do that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we, we, don't, we don't have anything. Turns around, looks at his wife and says, honey, there's no way we could have helped anybody here. Look at this crowd. There's no way we could have possibly done anything for them. And that kind of repeated itself anywhere from five to 10,000 times. Honestly, 10,000 people, 5,000 men, 2,500 women, 2,500 children walk out without taking something to eat? Really? Ray Goforth was the head of the aerospace. And he is personally responsible for many of the things that you, you get today and around your house because of the aerospace. And that was you know, like microwaves and the like. And he said this, there are two types of people who will tell you that you cannot make a difference in this world. Those who are afraid to try and those who are afraid you will succeed. That's where we are today. Mordecai told Esther, go forth. Jesus told the disciples, go find. 5,000 men and only one little boy was willing to risk all he had. What does that say about the followers of Jesus? No different today, really. We need to step up and step out. Here's the thing. If we want to change this world, and this world is in desperate need of change, then we have to be willing to stand up and not take a knee to every voice that shouts louder, every promise that is given that has no basis in truth, every expectation that this world provides or expects on us. We must not bow to any of those, but only to Almighty God. We need to be the Mordecais in the lives of the Esthers in our life and around us. We need to love and we need to care and we need to stand. And risk, risk, let me share this with you, risk. The only thing that assures a God-glorifying result, the only thing that assures a God-glorifying result is the will to take the risk. God is not in schools today, not because of the world that doesn't believe in Him, but because of the world that does. That's why He's not there. We didn't take a stand then, and we feel somehow we probably can't take a stand now. It's too late. Really? It's not too late. We're too far along. No, we're not. If blind people can see, lame people that ever walked can walk. If the dead can be raised, and Jesus himself said we would do greater things than this, 
we can change this world to almighty God's glory. But we're going to have to stand up and be willing to take the risk. Now, before I walk away from this opportunity in your living room, I'm going to say you this one thing. The greatest risk you can ever take is the risk to love God and allow Him to love you. Because He will call upon you to step up. The risk I'm asking you to take, if you haven't already done so, is to say, Lord, I need you in my life and forgive me. I am a sinner. I'll pray with you. And if you're in the middle of your home, I ask you right now to be prepared to do that. And if you do know the Lord, and maybe you can look back in your life and realize there were many opportunities in which you could have stood up and made a change, but you just didn't because, well, too much of a risk. Now's the time to turn away from that and make a difference. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. And if you are led, take a knee. And let's pray together. Almighty God, we come before you humbly, fearfully. And I ask you, Lord, that you will forgive us. You will forgive me of our sin. That you will rise us up, Lord God, that we might not only rise from a bended knee before you, but to stand on firm feet of will to make a change that is right and holy before Almighty God. This world needs a change, Lord. And you have called me to be a part of that change. Help me, Lord God, to be the voice that you called me to be. Help me, Father. Help me, Father, to be the voice that someone else needs to hear so that I might encourage them to be the Esther you called them to be. But in all cases, Lord God, in everything that I do from this moment on, I ask you to come into my life and forgive me of my sin, to clear my mind and make my eyes open to see the opportunities that lay before me, and that you will give me the unction and the courage to step out and to share your truth in love and the love that you have for your creation. And I ask that in the name that we risked it all and gave it all, the name above every name, the name that holds it all together, the name that will speak to our heart and give us guidance and direction. In the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord, I say amen and amen. God bless you. You have a wonderful week in the Lord.